All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, forgive the background noise. I am outside at my house. And of course, all the lovely noise that was not being made this morning is now being made now because, of course, you know, as soon as nature hears I'm doing a podcast, they got to uh, intervene and interject. Anyway, welcome back to another episode of the Mike the New Haven podcast. Uh, I believe this is going to be episode 73. I'm losing track. Yeah, it is episode 73. And this is a special one because, as you know, we do it all on the podcast. We talk to different folks from different fields. It's not just uh, exclusive to one thing or another. And there's many series within the podcast. You may recall Features of the Finest, which features my interviews with members, retired members of the NYPD, the Tales from the Boom Room, in which I uh, chronicle retired members of the Arson Explosion Squad and the Bomb Squad of the NYPD. Uh, and there's also uh, other mini series in the works, such as Captivating Cases, uh, which will be coming soon regarding major cases of the NYPD. But I was doing this podcast and I figured, you know what? I got to show love for the FDNY too. I haven't had an FDNY related guest and you know, on this show since Tom Von Essen, the former commissioner back in 2018. So it's about time that we do show love to the retired members of the FDNY with the new mini series that kicks off today, volume one of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. So to kick off this mini series, which I'm very excited about is my next guest who I met via another podcast in the live chat. Shout out to the guys at Getting Salty, a great podcast which you should be listening to if you don't already. My next guest is a man who spent 32 years on the front lines fighting the flames as a member of the New York City Fire Department. He joined the department in September of 1981 and retired as a lieutenant in 2013. An expert scuba diver, his training would come in handy. He's eventually served as the officer in charge briefly of the FDNY scuba unit, as well as a rescuer for the FEMA's notoriously elite search and rescue team. It is a retired Lieutenant Ray Seeley. He is the first guest of the Best of the Bravest miniseries, and he joins us now on the Mike the Name podcast. Ray, what a pleasure to have you. Welcome. How are you? Mike, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, you, you spending your time with me, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in your in your uh, endeavors here. Well, thank you, Ray. Uh, you know, we got to know each other, like I said, via the live chat. It's a very funny live chat uh, every Monday and Thursday for the Get Salty show at eight o'clock. And uh, Ray's an interesting guy. He's been a guest on the show, too, if you want to check out those interviews that he did with Kevin Kubler and Luba Frano. So and uh, it's great. It's great to have him here. So the first question is a hard one. I'm just kidding. Uh, Where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Uh, originally, my, my parents were from uh, Flushing, Queens. Uh, we moved out to Long Island, Hicksville. Uh, which has always been a, a the bane of a bunch of a of, of good jokes about the name. Uh, when I was a little kid, probably three years old, and I grew up in Hicksville, and uh, I, I I went to school right around the block from where I grew up. I uh, attended college in town, uh, rather uh, you know right nearby, and uh, it was always such a convenient uh, commute once I started working in New York City that I I bought a home, and I've been here ever since. And so now it's time to leave, but. It's convenient still uh, for getting around, and and it's in the middle of the island. It's still a nice place to live. Strong Island, you know, they don't call it Strong Island for nothing. You don't want to, you don't want to do the the retired cop and fireman thing and go down to Florida just yet. Nothing wrong with that, you know. Shout out to Hank Molay and Bobby Gallione, but uh, not quite yet. So, you know, how early on in life did you know you wanted to be a fireman? You know, I I, I watched my father work. He was a uh, he had a college degree. He he worked in the business world, and a, a couple of times he was uh, laid off over the years. And it was a, uh, it was a, uh, during the uh, the sixties and the seventies, and the economy wasn't the best. And uh, and I said, you know, I I, I want to get a job that uh, that it's sort of a layoff proof or less prone to being uh, losing one's job. So I said, I'm, I'm going to go to the civil service. And I originally thought I would uh, I, I was. I wanted to be a, a cop. I wanted to be a police officer. And uh, I, I, I took every test I could. And in the meantime, I was 19 years old and I, I joined the volunteer fire department. And I really joined that because I had a, a close to home encounter with the volunteer fire service. And I thought to myself, that is something I'd really like to do. Uh, so then I joined the volunteer fire department. I, I got the bug. I took the test for the uh, New York City fire department and I was lucky enough to get hired. And I just uh, my my service my career has been based in in the fire service. Absolutely. So you know the fire academy is as interesting because to my police guest I asked the same question. You know the fire academy is rigorous. It should be obviously because you want to make sure that you're breeding the best. And back then, I mean, 1981, 1980, 1981. These guys are hard, and they probably lived through the war years of the FDNY, other stuff. I mean, these guys have just about seen it all. So when you're getting trained by them in the academy, what would you say was the most important lesson they taught you? I, I think that uh, they they taught you that to really know your place, that you didn't know anything. You were probably you should uh, keep your ears open and your and your mouth shut. But uh, the the 
training was really based toward what they thought were problems, uh, the everyday problems that you had in the fire service and to the things that were most dangerous to the firefighters. Uh, so they taught you how to put up ladders, how to stretch hose lines. But one of the things that was really stressed during our time the short six weeks that I went to the academy for was uh, the, the life-saving rope because I did an incident uh, in 1979, 1980, where uh, two firefighters lost their lives uh, when a life-saving rope broke and they both uh, plummeted to their, their deaths. So uh, the, the fire department had come up with a new uh, synthetic type rope and a, and a new procedure. And they, we drilled on that an awful lot in uh, my time in the academy. It was really a, a major topic of training yeah yeah that was a uh, stuff you know the self-contained breathing apparatus uh first aid cpr uh that, but it was, it was only six weeks so everything was sort of a gloss well uh, yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there but um that that, that incident that you're referring to tommy mcteague actually talked about a retired member of uh, the fdny's rescue three um very sad, uh, uh, you know, and there, and that it, it's, it's unfortunate that incidents like that, in which people are seriously injured or even killed, prompts the change as opposed to just being proactive and getting out ahead of it. But it's unfortunately the way of the world. So, like I said, coming on in September of 1981, um, this is in the aftermath of the war years, which is during the 60s and 70s. That you mentioned the economy was not that good during this time. Uh, so it was quite the time to be a public servant in New York City. So. When you got out of the academy, where were you initially assigned, and who would you credit as the senior man that most helped you acclimate to the job? Well, back then it was really uh, if who you knew really predicated uh, where you where you were going to be assigned. Right. So I, I really didn't know anybody. So uh, I went to uh, Engine Company Two Ninety Two in Woodside in Queens, uh, which is on Queens Boulevard. It's a, it was a mixed neighborhood of. Uh, uh, residential and uh, older type uh, multiple dwellings, but in quarters with Engine 292 was Rescue 4, and all those guys were really experienced firefighters, very motivated guys who worked in all the busiest places during the war years. And when I got on the job, I, I told the story before, I was sort of young, I was 24 years old. Uh, most of the guys I worked with in this firehouse had more time on the fire department than I had on the earth. So, so I, I guess I, I, I thought, I, I guess I, that I was entertaining to them because I was a typical, typical stupid kid. But uh, uh, there were so many of them that, uh, that took me uh, under their wing that tried to teach me. Uh, one guy, Arnie Merkich, I remember very well. And uh, another guy was, uh, who actually uh, lost his life uh, at a fire and rescue floor was a, a lieutenant named Tommy Williams. And he was actually, uh, hell, he said, you got to get out of here, kid, because it's too quiet. It wasn't really a busy firehouse. Mm. So it was a quiet place. And uh, it, most of the guys that had worked there had in the engine had either worked in busy places and went there to sort of retire into a place that they didn't have to do too much mm. after a long career. So they were sort of looking at the end of their career where Tommy Williams, he was smart enough to say, well, you, you're motivated, you want to go somewhere. And he actually said, call this guy, this Captain Sal Russo. He's in, uh, he's in Ladder 108 in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's a busy place. Go talk to him and, and try to get there. So that's what I did. And uh, I got off probation. Uh, back then you had, a, even still, once uh, you can't transfer unless you're off probation, which is a year since you get appointed. And uh, then I was actually lucky enough to be transferred in November of 1982 to Lotto 108. And that was, I, I learned so much there. There were so many guys that motivated firefighters. The place was busy. It wasn't war years busy, mm -hmm. but it was comparatively busy to the rest of the city. You were there until 1998, I believe, right? Yeah, I, I stayed there 16, 16 years. years. 16 years. I, so... couple, I left a couple of times. I, I, I went to rescue uh, two for, uh, for a few months. Uh, I didn't stay because... Um, it was really busy. They were really busy. And I, I was working a lot on the side. I really needed to, my side job. And so I, I sort of had to leave in order to continue working on the side, as most firemen do. 
Yeah, yeah, it's not uncommon for firemen and cops to have that sec- to have that side job in addition to what they already do. Um, you know, you mentioned the age thing. It's funny because I, I, on a way lesser extent, I've kind of experienced that in the live chat, you know, on the Mondays and Thursdays, because for there was a while where obviously it's kind of anonymous. You don't know who's who. And it wasn't until I said I was 21 that the jokes came flying in and you said something hilarious. And he was like, I got ties older than you, which is true. So when you said that, I'm like, that kind of brought that back to my head because I'm kind of in the same position, although in a much different sense. So I want to pivot back for a second because there's a metaphor, and we're talking with retired uh, FDNY Lieutenant Ray Seeley here in the Mike Canadian Podcast, Volume 1 of the miniseries, Best of the Bravest. Um, there's a metaphor in the Department for Probationary Firemen, or probies as they're called, in which you know they're referred to either as being a white cloud or a black cloud. So for my listeners that don't understand the terminology, could you explain that? Well, when you go to work, you're sort of at the, uh, the uh, at sort of pro to uh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen by a matter of luck. And so if you're not lucky enough to go to fire or be working when anything big is happening, you're considered a white cloud. Like when you go to work, you walk in the door and they say, oh, the white cloud is here. Nothing's going to happen today. And then conversely, that if you happen to be that guy that's lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on the situation, to be working every time uh, something hits the fan, then you are the the black cloud. And something <laughs> that, that's like a welcome thing. I said, oh. It's been quiet. The black cloud's working. Hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get something good tonight or today or whenever the tour starts. And yeah, that, that's that was I first learned about that in the uh, Naud Day Brothers documentary. Where prior to a day we'll talk about a little later, um, you know, they were saying that Tony Benetatos, who was at the time a probie when he was first coming on, was one as they described it, one very white cloud because nothing happened whenever he was on the on the tour except for like a little brush fire. So speaking of first fires, that was his first fire, I believe. Uh, do you remember your first fire? And if so, I mean, what was it like? Uh, the first fire of any. Uh, any consequence that when an engine, when I was working on engine, engine 292, was actually a fire in a motel. Mm. And uh, there was a, you know, one of the, one of the rooms was going uh, pretty good in the, in the back of the motel is uh, getting the hose line to it was sort of involved. It was uh, through a side alley over a six foot fence down a wall. Uh, and, but it was really, you know, in reality, it was a, uh, it was a fireproof structure. The fire didn't extend, but it was um, getting the hose line in place is always a, a challenge right. uh, for any 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 fire department, whether it's career or volunteer. Mm-hmm. So remember, we uh, we threw the hose over the six foot fence that was on top of a three foot wall. So I jumped over the threw the hose over the fence, climbed the fence, jumped down, and uh, sprained my ankle once I hit the ground. So uh, mm-hmm. we put out the fire. It's it's really not anything you know more than a one alarm fire. So now I'm limping around and uh, had this boss who wasn't normally assigned. So now well, I have to report the injury and you have to do this report was called a CD 72. And it was a report that would describe the nature of your injury and how it was received. That way it was, you know, the, the fire department would then assume your care because it was a line of duty injury. So I remember this boss, I really didn't know him too well. I got to know him later on, but uh, there was a little line on the report that said, uh, how could this injury have been prevented? And this guy was actually pretty a funny guy. He goes, uh, look before you leap. Before you <laughs> the report. So, so that was my, my first lesson before uh, for my go. fire in, in, in New York City. There you go. Reminds me, reminds me of my mom, you know, when, when she'll say just in general to me, and if she listens, I know she's going to get a laugh out of this part. Mike, common sense common sense you know but hey you know common sense isn't so common and when you're in the when you're in the thick of it you're young and you're doing it i mean hey sometimes you just forget those details you know because you're trying to do a good job so you mentioned working in ladder 108 for the most part of you know the better part of 16 years except for uh, pivots here and there and it's not all the same in the acting way of course there's the rescue units there's the scuba units which you would be in later there's the engine and there's the ladder so in a ladder company at a fire for an outsider like myself, what is the exact function of ladder company? Well, the ladder company is uh, is not the the guys that put out the fire. I like to consider the ladder company as a support personnel for the engine company. Right. Uh, the engine company stretches the line; they put the water on the fire. The ladder company's job is to uh, get entry into the building, force the doors, search the apartments. Uh, to ventilate the building and to search and make sure that everybody's rescued. Actually, the, the major function of the ladder company is, is life safety. Your job is to make sure that the people that are in there get out safely or are removed safely 
to preserve life. So an inside team, which is the officer is usually uh, in charge of that. Uh, one firefighter will carry the forceful entry tools and another fire, firefighter will carry uh, a, a two and a half gallon pressurized water extinguisher and a, and, and a six foot um, pipe pole or hook that's used for breaking windows or opening ceilings and walls to uh, look for fire extension. And so that's the inside team. And then you'll have a, a person on the uh, that's assigned to the roof. And then that's that's a really important position in a uh, in an occupied multiple dwelling because that roof firefighter's job is to go to the roof and open skylights or bulkheads to the stairways that go to roofs and let the smoke out of the building and heat out of the building so that the conditions inside are uh, the, the, uh, made more tenable for the people that might be trapped. And there's a person called the outside vent firefighter, and his job is to you know, go to a point that's opposite the nozzle, check the fire escapes, throw portable ladders if anybody's trapped, uh, and really to just do things that help the engine company advance into the to the seat of the fire in the burner building. I asked this question to an emergency service uh, cop because I said, you know, um, when you're in the thick of it as firemen and police and EMS are, especially, I mean, firemen, you're literally in the thick of it. There's smoke and there's fire all around you. Staying focused is a lot easier said than done because, I mean, situations like that, the normal civilian like myself, I, I made the joke, listen, I'm going to the bathroom by myself in that situation. It's scary. So for a fireman in a situation like that, what is the key to not losing focus and, and staying on, on point? Well, you sort of really have to uh, say to yourself, well, I'm here to solve the problem, not become part of the problem. And you have to make a, a deliberate effort to stay calm and not lose your stuff. Because if you're if you're panicking, then you're no good to anybody. And that, that brings me to another point that um, everybody talks about hazing. Uh, and hazing, while not politically correct now, I thought and still think is an important part of any emergency service. Because if you've got somebody that's not a calm individual and you have a dozen guys in the firehouse razzing you, and all of a sudden that you lose your bracket, fly off the handle, or you know, challenge somebody to a fight, or uh, get upset, what are you going to do when you're actually at a burning building? And it's it's terrible. Sometimes it's terrible. People are jumping out windows. You, you're seeing people that are horribly burned. You're in you're in a dangerous situation and in danger of being injured or killed yourself. So you really need a, a, a calm, steadfast person. And if somebody's going to lose their stuff when they're getting teased in the firehouse, you really wonder what they're going to do once they're actually in the thick of it in the street. So, uh, you know, while it, now it's called hazing, back then it was called, um, I'm trying, and I know that you got your ball breaking, you know, I don't want to overstep the, but uh, it, it's a it. part of any emergency service. You know, military, the forces are going to rash you, they're going to give you a hard time, they're going to test your limits of your mental ability. Uh, now it's sort of uh, tamed down because uh, it's not part of the everybody gets a trophy culture, but and, and I think that's actually to the detriment of, of any emergency service, but it's the way of the world now. And, and I don't get it because you know what? Most of us, myself included, the, the, in middle school, the lunch table in middle school was our version of the firehouse kitchen table. I mean, it was no holds barred, man. All bets were off once you got to that lunch table in, in middle school. And we used to say the most obscene, well, you know, we used to, point being, we used to say some wild things to each other. And I'm like, you know, if you can survive that, what's a little teasing in the firehouse? You know, that's my thing. Uh, I, I think there is a line, though. I mean, it, yeah, of course, there has to be a point that, uh, you know, it, 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 it of course, it, it can't be anything that's ethnic or sexual in nature or right. identity, anything like that. But if it's just mainly, you know, you, you, you dress funny and you, and, you, and you get a better barber, yeah. You know, and that's the stuff that should still be allowed. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That should be considered uh, creating a, a, a hostile work environment. Right. You know, no, a hostile course. work environment is when you go in a burning building and somebody doesn't do his job and, and stay with you properly. The, the, the hostile work environment isn't in the kitchen table where you can just pick up your cup of coffee and go powder in your locker. So that's a, it's a different thing. No, you're right, though. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So I wanted to ask you about this as well. I mean, again, you, 32 years, I'm sure you had your fair share of close calls, excluding like the major emergencies, which we'll touch on later. Uh, so what is the closest call that sticks out to you where you said to yourself afterwards, wow, that could have went really bad? 
uh, I remember we went to a building that was we thought was vacant, but it was there actually a, a crack lab. And this place was roaring. I mean, it was really chugging and the smoke was banked down into the street. So you've been to fires like that before, if you've, if you've been anywhere and done anything. So we just said, OK, we're going to go. And everybody started moving. And all of a sudden, the chief said, everybody stop and stand still. And the building collapsed into the street. Mm-hmm. But there was so much smoke. And then when the building collapsed, the smoke just billowed out in the street where you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And everybody just stood still. And then when the smoke finally lifted, the, the collapse was not even four feet from us in the street. The building had like slid down into the street. And then we just looked like, wow, that was really close. If we had taken two more steps, we would have been crushed by the by the fallen building. But this chief, he was just so, he was afraid of the building and he just said, stop, everybody don't move. I guess he saw something that we didn't see and uh, the building just collapsed. That's that's why he's a chief. I mean, it's amazing, right? This this intuitiveness of, of these chiefs and uh, and of these uh, uh, other other gentlemen, these senior senior guys, lieutenants and, and captains that are just they have that extra instinct just to know. Um, I've always marveled at that. Um, so you know that that being said, you see a lot as a fireman. I'm sure you saw tons of things that you're never going to forget in 32 years on the job. And it's not easy to come home and decompress. And that's why some cops and some firemen and other first responders, nurses and ERs, things like that, they struggle, you know, and who wouldn't when you have to see these type of things. So for you coming home at the end of a day, in which maybe you saw something that really, you know, tugged at you emotionally, what helped you to just decompress and, and, and not let it bother you too much? Well, I remember uh, there was a time back in the eighties where we still uh, we still were really busy. And for a while I was, I, I, I go home and I said, I'm really tired of seeing dead people. You're tired of seeing burnt people. You've got seen, you know, shooting, stabbings, the car accident victims. And I just remember I went on vacation and I said, I need a vacation just to get away a little bit, do something for yourself. I think is important, you know, go for a run, exercise, read a book. Uh, back then I, I was able to go skiing a lot. I remember I, I went skiing for a few days and that, to, de- to separate yourself from the incident, I think, is, was important then, is, and it is important now. Back then, I don't think we were as tuned to PTSD as any emergency service is now. Uh, and I think guys take better care of themselves now, and I think there are more resources now for guys that, that do struggle uh, with uh, a traumatic event. Uh, say it's a, a fire with a large loss of life or a, a fire that uh, a fellow firefighter is, is injured or killed. Uh, they have a counseling unit now. They have uh, peer groups that are, that, that are able to help guys deal with it. And, it's, and I think that it's much better now than what it was because yeah. of the awareness. I would agree with that. And it's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing because these people are putting themselves in the front lines every day. And it's the least that we can do in return because nobody understands it. I listen, I'm buff. I'll come out and say it. And you can, you probably already knew that I'm a buff, but I'm not on the front lines. I don't know. And so to have somebody there that when you vent about these things, generally speaking, knows exactly what you're talking about because they felt the same thing. It's a very good thing. And I, and I hope that it continues to expand so that the struggles aren't as prevalent um, going forward. Um, so that being said, you know, 1998 is interesting because the FDNY around this time launches the Special Operations Command, which is still in existence today and encompasses many different aspects of uh, heavy rescue work. And I've always been fascinated by it, and you were part of it, and, and so I want to get your take on it. Squad 270 in Queens, I believe, is where you first went in 98 after 16 years with uh, Ladder 108. So by this point, 17 years in the job. Uh, pretty good pace, as you mentioned earlier, with Ladder 108 in Brooklyn. Uh, what prompted this change to go into SOC? Uh, actually, it was, I was working in Williamsburg for a long time. The, uh, the commute was, uh, wasn't the best in the world. Uh, and the nature of the neighborhood, there were a lot of housing projects. Uh, and the housing projects, uh, are, um, they were a handful. They were a problem. Uh, there's a city... Uh, at the time, wasn't really taking care of them. They were made always elevator problems. There was uh, a lot of drug problems. There were a lot of fires in the building, w- water leaks, uh, compactor fires. It just you have so many people living in one place that, and the building as an infrastructure is is used heavily. So there's a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage fires. There's 
so you just get tired of uh, 108. We had a lot of housing projects. Uh, we used to call ourselves one Otis eight because we went to so many stuck elevators and elevated emergencies like Otis elevator. Um, and I, yeah, this was like, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to see different things. I wanted to learn different things. So once uh, the squad started and um, the squad was originally designed to uh, take engines that weren't really doing a lot of work. They were underutilized as, uh, as the commissioner Von Essen said at the time and give them extra tasks. And, and, and that part of those tests was to meet uh, the needs of uh, what they thought, what could happen in the world of uh, terrorism. And that came to be true in uh, with uh, the World Trade Center collapse uh, and hazardous material responses. Uh, it's just an extra fire duty that they foresaw happening uh, to have additional resources, not just the uh, five rescue companies, but to have extra companies, the squad companies that were trained in tactical rescue, like the rescue companies are, mm -hmm. and that were also trained in uh, hazardous material operations uh, with everybody trained to being a hazardous material technician so that you could run, respond to uh, a leaking diesel uh, tank on an on a overturned tractor trailer, or you could conversely respond to uh, a nerve gas incident and have to wear uh, a level A total encapsulating suit. So your, your training had to be broad enough to, to cover any possible eventuality. And that was what the squad was for, to augment the hazmat response, to augment, augment the, uh, the rescue company capabilities. And uh, Chief Downey, Chief Ray Downey, he, he saw the need for a, a bigger, broader special operations command. And this was his idea, his baby, and he, he brought it to fruition, uh, where now there's, uh, we started with seven squads, there's now eight squads, in addition to the five rescues. So every borough has a redundant uh, rescue and hazardous material capabilities. In the event that there is a major incident, uh, so each borough is uh, capable of standing alone to, to meet uh, any possible emergency. It's a good thing, and I'm sure if Chief Downey was still around, um, and sadly he got killed on 9-11, for my listeners that don't know, I'm sure he'd be proud of what it's become, you know, and, and absolutely, he was a very re revolutionary fireman, and if you, for my listeners, if you don't know who he is, just read up on him. He was a really terrific fireman, a terrific guy by all accounts. Um, so, you know, I, but before I continue, was Collapse Rescue a part of SOC too? Uh, yes, it is. Um, okay. The, the, the fields that the, uh, the, that the rescues of squad special operations uh, command response to, uh, other than hazardous material, is um, high angle rope rescues, like a, a couple of window washers get stuck on the outside of a high rise. Yeah. Uh, confined space rescues, like somebody uh, uh, working in the sewer treatment plant that gets caught, or in a uh, in a power plant that gets caught in a uh, in a, a turbine type of cleaning situation. Uh, also respond to a collapse situation, a building collapse. Um, all these different, uh, you know, collapse, confined space, I trench rescue, a, a trench, uh, guys working in a trench and it collapses on them. All these uh, <clears throat> fields uh, are very dangerous to the rescues where if it's not the, if it's not approached the right way, the rescues are in great danger of becoming victims too. So you know how, how to respond and properly operate with specialized equipment that each, uh, each field requires. So the rescues were called uh, moving toolboxes and the squads were actually the, the, the same uh, the same idea. We had a lot of equipment and you had to be uh, you had to be adept and familiar with every piece of equipment and 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 be able to operate with any anything that was on within the scope of your our, our responses. That actually segued perfectly into the next question I was going to ask and you covered most of it because I was going to say at a given large scale emergency, like, for example, the Father's Day fire in 2001 or other stuff in general, uh, construction accidents, things like that, because in New York City, uh, Mark Twain uh, once had a great line. It's like New York City would be a real nice place if they ever finished it, you know, but somebody's yeah. always, you know, so there's a lot of propensity for that, too, because think about it, at a large scale emergency, you got the rescue units, there's the squads. And the NYPD's got the emergency service unit. So you all have these elite skill, highly skilled individuals, but without a good chain of command, it's not going to work. So I, you covered it perfectly because I was going to ask is like how generally at major emergencies would that chain of command work when you covered it? So, um, you know, when you're, um, 
a part of this uh, sock, you know, obviously, like I said, you had 16, 17 years from the job. You got newer guys coming on that were a part of this. Now you're, you know, that position that you were in in 1981, uh, now these guys are in that same position. So what would you try to tell them, uh, especially in a unit like this, that would help them become better firemen? Well, you try to um, teach them by, by telling things that you did. You know, anecdotes are, are, are great means to tell somebody, to, to teach somebody. So you would always draw back to, I, I saw this type of situation. We saw this once. At this type of fire, this happened. Um, saw this happen once with a life-saving rope evolution. Uh, this went wrong at this type of thing. Where you would draw on your experiences and add them to the everyday training that you did in order to, to make it more real, make it more palpable for the guys to, to show them that th this is the real deal. It's not just what if, it's, it's if when. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, and that, that kind of advice, I mean, you always want to in general, and, uh, and I'm, and I'm learning this now in my chapter of life is at 21 is this guy, this has got to be closed. These are got to be open, you know, and for, and for the audio listeners out there, I'm pointing to my ears saying they may be open. My mouth. They may be closed. Although it's not right now, because if I close my mouth, it wouldn't be a very good podcast. So, um, you know, I, I, you're doing great. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we're talking with Ray Seely here in the Mike Name podcast. So nice of him for him to join us as we kick off the mini series, the best of the bravest uh, interviews with the FDNY elite. So I, I, I do want to ask you about this. Um, uh, September of 2001, you had 20 years on the job. Um, if you, you could have retired if you wanted to, although obviously you, you didn't want to because you wanted to keep going. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, I don't think any person, cop, fireman, EMS, whatever, could have been prepared for what came on September the 11th, uh, 2001. I've never gotten the full, I mean, when Von Essen told me about his experience, but I've never gotten the experience from somebody who was not in a high chain of command, but was, you know, in one of these uh, units of the of the FDNY. So that day, from your perspective, from the moment the first plane hit and you heard that to everything that would follow, take me through what you did. Uh, Squad 270 is, is out, it's in uh, Richmond Hill, which is uh, just north of uh, JFK Airport. So it's pretty far removed from uh, from the city, from Manhattan. Uh, I remember I was working uh, at the 24 where I started working uh, 6 p.m. the previous evening. I was supposed to work at 6 p.m. The, the day of the 11th. Uh, remember, it wasn't really a busy night. We were sitting in the, the firehouse kitchen and uh, the firehouse kitchen had a skylight. And I remember looking at the skylight going, wow, that is one beautiful blue sky. And then uh, over the voice alarm, which uh, is it's an audible alert system within the firehouse. So the dispatcher will tell everybody what's going on. Like say if the dis computer assisted dispatch system goes down, they'll use the voice alarm system from the central dispatch office. Uh, and they announce uh, major fires uh, in other boroughs. Not So it's citywide announcements of something going wrong. So the, like I remember there was an announcement to, it came over as a uh, uh, Manhattan announcing a second alarm uh, at Box. Uh, what do I forget? Or eight oh oh five? Five oh eight seven, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact box number, but uh, uh, a second alarm uh, in in the World Trade Center uh, on the upper floors, and it was just that was all they said. And we we were, we were kidding around saying, ah, it's probably a, a waste paper basket fire because the high rise fires are very difficult fires to fight, and then. Uh, then it came on the news, and then there was a report of a plane crash into the building. And then we put on the news, and it, you knew right away that it was not just a Cessna that had flown into the building, that it was a, a large craft. And, and then then they started zooming in on it, going, wow, this, this is really bad. This, this is really bad. Yeah. And then they say, well, you could hear a lot of this companies being dispatched to it. And then the second plane crashed into the towers. And uh, the captain of my company was that was Freddie Lafamino at the time, and he was he's been on the uh, Getting Salty podcast a couple of times too. Yep. And okay. he was like, "We just get taken upon ourselves to go. We'll go when they send us to go because we still have to cover the rest of the city." Uh, we had a couple other responses in the meantime. Uh, we went to a bomb square on an elevated subway line, and we were there for forty minutes until the cops cleared the suspicious package, and that's probably what kept us alive because. Uh, uh, we weren't dispatched because we were at a different alarm. We had another we had another incident, and then when we got back to quarters, that's when the uh, the first tower collapsed. Then we said, "Oh wow, this 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 is really bad." 
And I said, wait, I thought, I, thought, I told everybody, I said, call your families, tell me you love them. This is going to be really bad today. And a lot of guys did. And then the second tower collapsed. And then we were sent, uh, then, then, we, then, we, then we were dispatched to, to the World Trade Center. And when I got there, I was thinking, this is surreal. I never saw myself being in this position. It looked like war. The entire block was on fire, burning cars, people screaming on the radio, uh, mayhem, total mayhem. The, I was the last one, because since I was driving the fire truck, I was sort of the last one to leave. And I was as I was gearing up, uh, I heard the dispatcher calling for any chief on the uh, on the uh, west side of the building to uh, get in contact with him and take command. And you know, I run down a block and you're looking for something, you know, like where to, what, what to do, but there's, there's so much, you don't know where to start. And I, and I saw a battalion chief and I said, hey, chief, the dispatchers call for somebody over on this side of the building to uh, take command of the fire. But this guy just looked at me and he looked right through me. And I, I could think of um, the, the Civil War term for uh, like shell shock was a yep. CNN elephant. And I said, that guy saw the elephant. He's not helping anybody today. And I just, well, oh, fine. We just went to search for people and do whatever we could. And that was, that was the day. <laughs> That was the kind of. I, I imagine you know, and and it's it's, it came at a devastating cost for first responders in New York City. Um, the NYPD lost twenty three uh, members, uh, fourteen ESU officers, uh, eight members of the patrol squad, and then one detective from the bomb squad, who I've mentioned before on this podcast. Um, Port Authority police lost thirty seven officers. Port officers lost three officers. FBI lost an agent. Secret Service lost an agent as well. ADMS workers, one fire patrolman by the name of Keith Roma, who doesn't get mentioned a lot. And uh, then, of course, the biggest number of all, 343 firemen who made the ultimate sacrifice that day heroically. I'm sure you knew many of them. Uh, I just want to, uh, if I may, one, uh, one sure. port authority that uh, was, was, was one of my best friends, George Howard. Uh, yes, yes, yes. He didn't even work in that day. And, uh, but he was assigned to uh, JFK Airport through the uh, Port Authority Police. And he was on the emergency service unit. And because we responded down to JFK, I knew what his rig looked like. So when I was running down the block, I saw his rig parked with the doors open and all the tools on it. And I said, that's not like him, he's dead. And then later on, I was right. operating the file and uh, uh, on, on the handy talkie on the portable radios that each firefighter carries, uh, I heard, uh, oh, we, we've, recovered a body in the street at the dead cop and his name is Howard. And that's how I knew he was dead. Oh man, I'm sorry, Ray. Uh, no, I mean, it's a long time ago. It's 20 years ago and uh, you know, it's a, uh, you, you make the best of, of, of every right. situation. His son, Chris is uh, like my adopted son now, you know, uh, so that's like the good deck. Every, every blackout has a silver lining, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, you have to stay positive and look ahead and, uh, you know, everybody has stories like that. That was either a cop or a fireman that was working at that time. Uh, but you just want certain people to be remembered for what they did. And George is that guy for me. Um, and I mentioned Ray Downey earlier, who if you want to look him up, look up George Howard too for my listeners. He was he acted heroically. He was, he was a hero long before that day, as they all were. Um, he acted quite heroically during the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and rescued numerous people that day as well and, and made the ultimate sacrifice on the 11th. And, and, you know, I mentioned the bomb squad uh, detective earlier. I, I uh, That detective for my uh, newer listeners, I I because this, this story is the most chilling I've heard. You tell that one. Um, my buddy Don Sadawi, he'll be back on the show soon, a uh, member of the bomb squad, said that Detective uh, Danny Richards, um, when they were looking in his apartment days afterwards, because it was technically a missing persons investigation, they went, because he lived alone in Greenwich Village, into the first drawer of his desk, and he was off duty, he responded from home, and right in the drawer was his detective shield next to his last will and testament, which is to say he knew, as he prepared to walk out the door for what would be the last time, that he might not come back, and that was the story of a lot of guys that day, he never, he never came back, and after something like that, um, you know, a lot of guys retired, understandably, with that, that had to put the time in, you know, they, they left. Um, I probably would have done the same thing, but you stayed. Um, and well, you know, the, my state of appointment was September 5th, 1981, my 20th year, which I could have retired was September 5th, 2001. 2001. But I wasn't going anywhere. I was having a great time at work. I was enjoying it. I was working with great people and my kids were little. I 
I didn't have a second career lined up. And uh, so I said, well, not, my, my goal was to work 30 years, if not more. I always said I was going to stay as long as I could. And I did. But I wasn't planning on retiring because I'd gotten a late start with uh, getting married and having kids. <laughs> I think my, my youngest was three years old in uh, 2001. So I wasn't going anywhere. I needed a job. I needed benefits and uh, needed, needed to keep the lights on in the house. Yeah, no, of course. And it's admirable because you know what? It was guys like you that helped the FDNY rebuild itself. It wasn't easy. And, and of course, you can't, these men are irreplaceable. And we're not, and Ray and I aren't saying that. These men, you know, anybody that knew them, obviously, the memory lives on. And, but obviously, you know, new people must come in and, 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 and not necessarily fill the void. I don't think that's the right words, but do the best they can to carry on the legacy. That's a better way to put it. Um, and so it's important to have the senior guys around to do that. And, you know, by the time you left in 2013, which we'll touch on later, the FDNY, I think, and, and you could tell it better than I can because you were inside, of course, I was not. The FDNY has done a remarkable job of putting itself back together um, in the aftermath of that. And to where you're seeing the kids of these fallen firefighters now come on the jobs themselves. I think that uh, that the fire department maintained its ability to respond and protect the people in the immediate months after that uh, just showed uh, the strength of uh, not just the uh, everybody, the cohesion of the fire department team, but the, the strength of the bosses that were, you know, the, the chiefs of the department, the guys that were in charge, the uh, the, the head honchos, if you will. Uh, they did a great job of keeping everything together. Was it perfect? No, it was perfect. Nothing was. It was a lot of fog and war, but everything went on. Uh, training continued, hiring continued, and the lessons learned from that, I think, made every well, made everybody safer then and will continue to make people now improvements in the radios for instance yeah. um uh, ability uh, availability of protective gear um how to dispatch people and keep them staged away instead of a, a haphazard response would put every that puts everybody in the danger zone mm -hmm. I, I think that the fire department really learned a lot in in, in that respect to uh not have everybody just rush pell-mell to the scene, but to have a structured response and people in charge of that response, which was called the incident command system. Uh, I think that was one of the big important changes that came uh, to not just the FDNY, but to the police and, and to almost every emergency uh, service in the country because the, the, the federal government instituted the uh, incident command system that everybody had to comply with. And you know what else? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, to cut you off. FEMA training so that everybody's on the same page in incident command. So uh, so that everybody's calling everything the same thing. So everybody's using common uh, <clears throat> common nomenclature so that there's, there's no uh, miscommunication in the future. That was one of the good changes. Right. And, and, and what's so cool now, I mean, obviously, we wish if this didn't happen and that everybody that passed away that day would still be here with us. Um, but... That being said, I mean, how cool is it that the FDNY has an intelligence and a counterterrorism bureau? Like that, when you came on the job in 1981, if somebody would have told you the FDNY would have this super elite counterterrorism bureau, I mean, you probably wouldn't have believed it. It's just incredible. If, if you told me that anything that I did in my in terms of my career was going to happen, <laughs> in the I'd say you're out of your mind. The, just the, the amount of training that I've been through, the places where they sent me to school, I would have never believed that that, that would happen to me. As a fireman, I thought I was going to be carrying the, the can in the hallway of a housing project for 30 years. And that was fine at the time. I never would have thought I'd be sent, be sent to a, a bomb schools in, uh, in New Mexico or uh, live agent schools in, in Alabama or to uh, derail the, uh, train derailment classes in, uh, in Texas. I never saw any of those things happening back in 1981. And it took a terrible tragedy to uh, make that kind of training really important and important and uh, and available to, to to first responders. Absolutely, absolutely. And as Ron Zoni, our, our mutual buddy in the chat, Ron Zoni, who himself is a retired member of the service, he he put it to me best. You know, when he said, "It's the greatest show on earth. It's the greatest show on earth, and with it comes the great education for it." Well, if, if you can't go anywhere else and uh, get paid and, and see the things that you do. Exactly. 
exactly. It's just it's it's the best. And I miss the city. I'm like I said, I'm I'm located as the name of the podcast, which would suggest I'm located here in New Haven, Connecticut. But when this pandemic's over, it's the first thing I'm looking forward to getting back to the city and getting to see the sites again. So I I do want to touch on this, um, and I very much appreciate you sharing your perspective on the 11th. Uh, I, I'm glad that I I got your perspective. Scuba training and your involvement with the FDNY scuba unit. I mean, diving in New York City. Let's be honest, the rivers in New York City are not exactly what you would call uh, EPA friendly. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in those rivers. It was really strange how it uh, how that came to pass. I, I was a scuba diver on my own. I did you know, recreational diving. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was assigned after I got promoted. I worked a, a year in the field and I went back to SOC. But you had to you had to pay your penance and, and work for a year in the technical rescue school. Then uh, Chief Don Haid came up to me and he said, well, you're a diver and we need somebody to run the uh, scuba unit. Are you interested in doing that? I said, well, well, you know, we, we had a conversation. I said, sure, I'd, I'd like to do that. So uh, what was what was really important back at that time was that uh, diving was done by the rescue companies. Mm-hmm. It was a purely a rescue response. If a car went in the water or a plane crash or something like that, and there had to be a diver, that diver was a guy from the rescue company. And that was another one of Ray Downey's uh, legacies. Uh, so at the time, the only rescue company that wasn't scuba trained was rescue three so they had to get all the people in rescue three who were not weren't scuba qualified qualified and basic scuba and then they had to be trained to be proficient in in the dangerous situations dangerous toxic situations like you just described as you know as a you know, city's uh, waterway at the time could be an, o- an open cesspool um so they had a, a class, uh, once you got an open water class, you, you had to, to uh, take a class called Municipal Rescue Diver. And that was a bunch of dive uh, specialities that were combined uh, to, to make, um, make these guys proficient uh, in, in a rescue, being a rescue diver situation. Uh, the, that had was just like search patterns, diving in dirty water, uh, full encapsulation diving, where it's not like a, a regular scuba diver has his mask mm-hmm. and the regulator he st- sticks in his mouth. The fire department used to have that. And a bunch of guys were diving. Uh, I think it was in the Hudson River and a bunch of them got amoebic dysentery. Uh, this was back in the uh, eight, in the 80s. Um, so now the, the gear that the fire department uses, it's a full face mask. It's almost like a breathing apparatus. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the suits that they wear, they're dry suits. They're actually rated for hazardous material contamination. So they're not going to degrade and break down right away if they're exposed to something dead. And because the dry suits, they, that requires special training too. So it's a very involved class. I, I had to take the class because I hadn't taken it before. And I have to say it was actually the toughest physical class I've ever taken in any aspect of the fire service. I imagine. You had to, you, you had to um, in my, your pool training at the, the final end of the pool training, you'd have an Olympic sized pool and they'd put a weighted scuba apparatus in each corner of the pool and you had to swim underwater from each corner, take a breath and then swim to the next one. <laughs> underwater the entire time. It, 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 it's, it's not for the weak hearted and it definitely was for anybody else. And part of the dive training, you drive, you dive in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and that water was so dark and deep and dirty, you could take your flashlight and put it right to your mask like this, and it would still black out, totally black conditions. Wow. So, and you had to, you know, I mean, it was a, it's dangerous training, but it's a dangerous job. And it's one of these uh, jobs that's, um, it's a uh, low occurrence and high risk. So you have to train a lot. It doesn't happen a lot, but there's a great danger to the guys that are going in the water, whether it be the currents, running out of air, uh, getting caught uh, in debris, from the city being 300 years and piers and uh, wreck cars. And uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a special task, it's a special job. And it, it, it definitely is suited to the rescue companies. And I'm glad that they're the only ones that do it because it is so dangerous. They, they deserve kudos for doing it. Absolutely, it's a few, it takes a few good men and women, you know, to march into something like that. And I, I shout out to them. By the way, quick uh, aside for all my listeners, uh, if you can hear the background noise, I mean, there's just an ambulance going by. I apologize. I decided to do the podcast outside today because it's such a beautiful day. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, it was quiet this morning. You couldn't hear a pin drop on the block. Uh, but now when I'm out here, you know, everything is happening here in lovely old Elm City. So I apologize for that if you can hear it. Hopefully, hopefully you can forgive me for that. But 
Um, that brings me to 2006. So by this point, you're a lieutenant. So now you're in a, in a position of, of overseeing guys. And uh, you go into squad 288 with some some terrible guys named Lou Fafrano and Kevin Cooper. And I'm just kidding. Love those guys. They're the best. Um, they're working there. They're charter members of SOG. Great firemen. Obviously, many more um, great firemen there, too. So transitioning at this point with 25 years in the job from being in squad 270, and then the uh, school unit of the FDNY to now this elite squad 288 with these incredible gifted men. Um, what helped make your transition now as a boss into a new unit, uh, a seamless one? Uh, it, it had to be the people uh, that were assigned there because they knew me from being a firefighter. So once I was assigned there, they knew what I was before. And actually being a boss, I had to be a little bit more laid back uh, than I would normally be. <laughs> yeah. I, I I couldn't spout the way I used to spout. Mm -hmm. uh, Freddie Freddie allowed for me to actually told me now you know now that now that you're a lieutenant you can't throw guys across the kitchen table anymore. You know? <laughs> uh, or you having I, WWF championship matches in there? Huh? Always a lot of roughhousing in the firehouse, but uh, it was actually it was actually easy working there. Those everybody was so self motivated. They followed the rules because they wanted to be there. So if I said, uh, let's do something, they would make it better than what I said. Wow. And they, they, my, they, the, five, the, five, the people there made my, the last part of my career so worthwhile, such a pleasure. Uh, working with them was, uh, was always easy. There were never any problems. We just went to work, responded to what we were told to, did the training we were told to, and tried to make every day better than it was. I always told everybody that uh, every day you went to work, you should learn something new or remember something that you forgot. So a ton of reading every day, a ton of training every day. And uh, there was just, if you were into buff, as you say, firemen can be buffs too. And most buffs are the firefighters that work in New York City, go to a rescue or a squad. And, that, that, and that's a good thing because uh, their interests are rewarded by what they do and what they're exposed to. You know, and it's amazing listening to the podcast. And like I said, I was just busting chops earlier. Lou and Coos are great. I'm just messing with them. But, um, you know, hearing Lou, who was a lieutenant himself, describe some of these things and describe them so casually. I'm like, well, it's like, yeah, we did this and that. Like my mouth will be open watching the podcast. And I'm like, that, that's incredible. But again, it's a testament to the, to the terrific training and, and obviously the determination. And that's a good thing to have because it creates a sense of camaraderie, which is something that unfortunately with the way of the world, you just don't see a lot of. So to see guys band together for this common mission and that's to help people um it's it's a really without getting sappy of course it's a really beautiful thing and i'm sure you felt very privileged to have been a part of it oh i, I tell you i miss i miss the firehouse i miss working with the people i i miss the camaraderie in the, in the firehouse i i miss going to emergencies and fires with the guys you, you you miss that adrenaline rush you you miss that sense of teamwork when you when you do a good job um at a fire or an emergency where you come out and you say you guys did a great job and thanks for making us all look good. And that's, that's the best part of it. And not just in the rescue squad, that's the best part of any any fire department, and especially in, uh, in the FDNY. Absolutely. So 2013, you mentioned earlier, you didn't retire uh, in 01, and, and good on you for that. You know, you stayed, you, you stayed through a tough chapter. And But 2013, after 32 years, you did retire. So, you know, there's always that light bulb that goes off over a first responder's head that tells them, you know, you, you basically it's time. And there, there's always a saying in emergency services that uh, you'll know when it's time. And so that light bulb for you, what was it that told you after all, the, all those years? Well, it's time to go. Well, I it wasn't by my choice. Uh, I, I, I failed the pulmonary function test in the yearly medical. Mm. They uh, I, I was put on light duty. They sent me for a bunch of tests. And then ultimately it was decided that because of lung issues, that are uh, from 9-11 that, uh, that I had to retire. So, uh, so they, they made the decision for me, but I remember when I, when, uh, when I, I went to get some uh, extra medical opinions about what I should do, about what was going on with um, my lungs and my health. And uh, two different doctors told me, you, you gotta go, you can't do this anymore. And I felt like, wow, I, I just sort of felt like my best friend died. I said, well, this is what I've done. I joined the volunteer fire department when I was 19 years old. You know, that's what I've done. I mean, I did other things, of course, every, every, every fireman, every firefighter has or does, but uh, I just uh, 
I was like, well, it's time to go. It's almost time to go. So you say, well, it just, you know, forward, onward, you know, I mean, it was it's sort of melancholy to go, mm-hmm. but all good things come to an end. And uh, that you just have to realize and be an adult and just say, yeah, I guess you have to grow up and get a job. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, it's true because they say the old saying is, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I'm sure that you felt that way at 32 years in the job, um, for sure. I mean, but that that being said, I mean, you're off the job going on eight years now. So time's flown by. Um, and, I'm, and obviously, you have a lot to be proud of. You had a heck of a career. So what other projects have you have you thrown yourself into since then? But I, I never I never finished college. So I, I retired. I went back to college full time and I, I like I got a bachelor's degree. Oh, good uh, for you. Do that for, for my kids. I wanted to show them, listen, this old guy can do it. Because they were all approaching college age. And I said, you got to, you know, I want you to go to college. I want you to get your education. And you can do it because I can do it. So I made a diligent effort of doing it. Not just for me, but for the, for them to show them that, you know, if the, this if this old buffoon can do it, they can do it too. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, you know, I just, I Got into a lot of hobbies that I had before, and then I just had time for me. You know, I was just uh, hunting and fishing. Uh, my kids were still in high school and college, so I was busy with them. Uh, yeah. And and the stuff that doesn't go away, the, the stuff around the house, the money pit, uh, you always got to take care of that. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I wonder sometimes how I worked. I'm, I'm so busy being retired. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that because I was going to say, you know, that transition after retirement into civilian life can be a bit tricky because it's like you do it for so long. You're wondering, OK, well, now what? But it doesn't seem like you had a problem with it. Well, yeah, there were tough, tough times. And you talk to other people who had retired previously and they said the spring, summer, fall isn't bad. But in the winter, in the doldrums of winter, when it's cold and you can't go anywhere, that's when you're going to be bored. But what got me through the first few years, I, I went back to school almost right away once I got out. Mm-hmm. So, and I went full time. So I was busy. I was busy with school work. So mm-hmm. that that really helped too. That helped, you know, and then when I was done with school, I was bored for a little while. And I just, you know, I, I wanted to go for a master's degree, but at that time I, I had three kids in college and I was paying for it. <laughs> That's <Nah>. not going. <laughs> So, you know, and you're still fortunate enough to be able to, because again, I go back to the podcast. This is how I found out about you. You know, you're still passing on that expertise and that knowledge and those stories on to not only a younger generation of firemen, but an outsider like myself that's just, you know, growing up around civil servants is incredibly interested by it. And I imagine that getting the chance to share those stories on such a big platform, on such a great show, has been a a great help to you as well. Uh, I I was lucky enough to... um... Well, I, you know, you knew I was a volunteer firefighter. I, I did that for 36 years. Uh, I was also an instructor at the uh, Nassau County Fire Academy. I, I fell in love with the idea of teaching uh, because people, good people taught me. And I wanted to be somebody that passed on that knowledge and imparted my experiences to, to new people so that they could uh, be safer, or operate safer, maybe learn something from my mistakes, learn from things that I had seen and what I, things I had done. So, uh, I sort of, I missed that. And then when uh, the podcast started uh, with Louie and Kevin, uh, when they had me on, I just, I originally did it for them to, to help them. Like, uh, I'm here with you, you young guy, you're starting off. I want to, I want to see you do well. I appreciate and, uh, Yeah. And, uh, and those guys, I, I said, I like those guys. I wanted them to do well and to be able to talk and uh, to have people say they, exper- they appreciate learning from my experiences. That's, it just, that just reinforces what I had done, uh, what I was lucky enough to have done in the past. Absolutely. And for my, for my listeners um, who are wondering, uh, that, that aren't familiar with Getting Salty, if you're coming over from the Police Off the Cuff channel, which is a podcast, great podcast hosted by two retired members of the NYPD who do what, what Kevin and Lou do, they get on retired members of the service and they, they tell war stories. Um, basically, for my Off the Cuff fans who are, who are here, uh, Getting Salty is basically the FDNY version of Off the Cuff. Those guys, they get the same way Mark DeMayo and Bill Cannon get on retired NYPD guys and gals. They get on retired FDNY guys and gals, and they, they tell great war stories, and they share great advice on 
you know, how one can succeed today on the job. So check out their podcast too. They're fantastic. And obviously one of their uh, frequent guests and a good friend of theirs going back from job is nice enough to join me today. So Ray, I, I, you've been very generous with your time. I always have a segment I conclude with uh, called rapid fire. It's five hit and run questions from me uh, and five answers from you. So are you ready? Hit me. All right. So first up, most uplifting job you ever responded to? Uh, hmm, I just want to think about that a second. Take your time. Uh, it, it had to, you know, either like a childbirth or a really good rescue or something like that, where you, you, you know that you you did something really good for somebody and their life's going to be better from it. Uh, saving a cat or a dog at a fire, just something like that, where the owner was just so happy to to see their pet alive. There's just a little little things like that that just make not just one big thing, but so many little things that just make the job better. You know, helping somebody out at a car wreck. Uh, saving something personal it's, it, you know can you find this at a fire can you find these pictures can you look for this just doing those little things those little instances of humanity just make the job really special and good absolutely absolutely and you know what that person whoever it is they may not remember your name they may not even remember your face but they'll always remember the deed and they'll that, that'll leave a good impression in their mind so thank uh, absolutely for sure second you know are there dangerous jobs yes but there you, new york city is new york city there's funny jobs too funniest job you ever responded to oh it's there's something because you worked with so many funny guys that had like yeah. just a quick, quick senses of humor uh I remember it was a, uh, it was during the winter and we were at a car fire or something and uh, the traffic was backed up. It was in Williamsburg, it's snowing, it's cold and everybody wants the rubberneck and there was a bus stop like right in the way and we're waving this woman through. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Now she's so intent on looking at the, the fire that she, one guy's going, come on, come on, move through. And she drives right into the back of the park, the stop bus and the guy goes, good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah. That, 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 that reminds me of a, of a funny scene um, for all my SpongeBob fans that are listening to this. And um, you'll you know what I'm talking about. They're literally directing the Flying Dutchman, SpongeBob and Patrick, this the, the, the pirate ship that they're driving. And there's a bevy of rocks in front of them. And uh, he's SpongeBob saying to Patrick, "Keep going. You're good. You're good. You're good." And afterwards, he says, "And stop." He says to the Flying Dutchman, don't worry, Cat, we'll buff out those scratches. The whole ship is just destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> so, like that. so third, I mean, you mentioned you originally wanted to be a police officer earlier. But besides that, if not for firefighting or police force, what other, what other career could you have seen yourself pursuing? I, I could have seen myself being a, a nurse uh, or something in the medical field. Mm -hmm. uh, that was I was always sort of wanted to help people by advise uh, when I was really young, I said, oh, I want to be a doctor, but you can't be a doctor if you're dumb as a stump. So uh, <laughs> so civil service suited me fine. And something that, you know, probably wasn't as uh, rigorous uh, academically uh, would be something like, you know, nursing or, uh, you know, a respiratory technician or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. That's a great profession, too. So uh, fourth, second to last question, favorite boss or bosses, because you can say multiple or not strict that you ever had. Uh, my, my favorite boss ever, the guy that taught me the most. And uh, he just he just uh, died last year of a combination of uh, uh, Alzheimer's and, and COVID was uh, Captain Sal Russo. He was a legend on the job. He was in Ladder 108. He was a gruff old ex-Marine. Uh, tough dude, worked a bunch of busy places, worked in a uh, Ladder 120 uh, in, in the war years. Uh, he was a tough old coot. When he was a young guy, the stories of that, he'd take a battering ram, was about 50 pounds, and he would do sit-ups with the battering ram behind his neck. He he was he was a guy that you didn't want to mess with, but he just was so experienced and was such a great teacher that he taught you so many things, not just about uh, being a firefighter, but he run fishing trips for the firehouse and get everybody out fishing together. And he was just such a great guy in terms of uh, being the leader that you wanted to work for and be the man that kind of guy that you wanted to be. So he was actually my, my favorite boss ever. I mean, and plus the bonus was that he was a legend in the fire service. So if you said, oh yeah, I, I worked with Sal Russo, everybody went, oh, then you had to be okay too. Cause he would, he was not the kind of guy that would, that would suffer fools. So they, he, he, that was my, my best, my best guy. 
Well, uh, shout out to his family. Very sorry that uh, he passed away. Uh, the final question, fifth and finally, uh, knowing what you know, 32 years in the job, a lot of great teachers along the way, and you've learned some skills that you've passed down yourself. What advice would you give a young guy coming on the job now or gal? I would say uh, be into the job, learn as much as you can. Uh, study, read the books, even if you don't want to be promoted, because there's just so much to learn. Uh, there's so much information available in the FDNY. I mean, if you study for lieutenant, you 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 have a stack of books that's that long, and it, it's it's a, it's an arm with the books. You, if you put in milk crates, it's probably four or five milk crates. Yeah, books. Now wow. everything's DVD, but I say read those books and not just the the ones about uh, firefighting or building construction, but read about the the. Um, the administrative stuff, because well, that's all important. You you have to know that you have to be a professional, and you have to be not just a good firefighter. You have to be adept at the uh, the responsibilities, the civic responsibility that the job entails. And so you really should read everything you can and be as educated as you can in in what the job puts out, what the job publishes. Absolutely. And so that concludes what's been a really fun uh, episode of the Mike Dunham podcast to kick off the debut of the mini series, The Best of the Bravest uh, Interviews with the FDNY's Elite. So, Ray, before we go, uh, let's uh, promote ourselves. Anything that you want to shout out? Well, Mike, I just wanted to thank you for uh, having me on the show. I want to wish you the best of luck. And uh, I really want to say, uh, please watch uh, the Getting Salty podcast because uh, Louie and Kevin and their producer, Pete, they do a great job and uh, it's entertaining. And it's a little bit, it's not, it's not that genteel. It's a little bit, <laughs> no, it is not. A lot, a lot of off the cuff and a definitely firehouse humor. But I, I want to give those guys a shout out. And Hank Malay, come on this show. It's good too. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm about to say, hopefully you can. Hopefully you can come on soon, Hank. Your time's coming, pal. And hopefully I can chat with you uh, amongst other great members of the FDNY. So before I go, just quick, a, a few plugs. Before I, I normally plug the show, but before that, uh, New Haven, it's been a tough week for the New Haven Fire Department. We just lost uh, a great fireman in the line of duty, uh, Ricardo Torres Jr., or better known as Rico. Uh, he died uh, charging into a fire here in uh, uh, the, uh, the Westfield section of New Haven. Uh, it just it went bad and he got killed and he left behind a wife, a one year old and, and a couple of twins on the way. So uh, there's a GoFundMe out for him. I'm going to try to find it and link it in the description of this episode. Please go help his family out. He, he, he helped this city out. So it's the least that we can do in return for him and his great service to the city. And we want to just send our condolences to his family on a, a really horribly sad loss. Um, so as far as the show is concerned, you can find it anywhere that you get your podcast, iTunes, Spreaker, Spotify, uh, obviously YouTube, where you can catch the video version. Uh, look for it there. It'll be premiering for those of you Monday night at 8.30. Uh, so be, be sure to tune in uh, and catch it uh, tonight at 8.30. Uh, of course, great episodes in the world works this week uh to thursday oh, my buddy marvin mcintyre will join me as we will do a preview of the nba playoffs my knicks are in it i'm excited so looking forward to that and tomorrow i'm really looking forward to this one new york rangers legend 1994 stanley cup champion mike richter is going to join the show and i'm going to interview uh, mike about his great career with the rangers twitter i'm mike in new haven linkedin mike cologne connect with me there just type in mike cologne m-i-c apostrophe d and i'll be happy to connect with you and uh, all that being considered and said thank you guys for listening to the show uh, and like and like ray said listen to the getting salty show as well there they are uh, truly awesome so on behalf of a uh, retired lieutenant ray Sealy, i'm mike cologne this has been volume one of the best and the bravest and we will see you next time take care everyone <laughs>